This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Next on Up Next. Where I think we're headed now is not just a career trajectory where you go from one full-time job to another over the course of your career, but what you might call a career portfolio, which is you have a bunch of jobs at any given time. Welcome to Up Next. I'm Eric Berkowitz, and on this edition, we consider the future of work. With us today is Thomas Malone, Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, founding director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence, and the co-founding director of the MIT Initiative on Inventing Organizations of the 21st Century. Professor Malone has published some of the key articles and books that have both predicted and helped us make some sense of the enormous changes in the labor economy over the past few decades. In 1987, when most of us were first hearing about this oddity called the internet, he predicted the advent of electronic buying and selling, electronic markets for products, electronic outsourcing, and so on. A few years later, he coined the term Elancer for the new crop of freelance workers laboring in the information economy. And in 2004, he published a book called, conveniently enough for us, The Future of Work, in which he took stock of the new labor economy and made some predictions for its future. Lately, he has written on a vast variety of other subjects, including something he calls the collective genome. Welcome, Professor Malone. It's a delight to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You, your writing is so broad-based, and it, and it covers so many subjects, but in the future of work, you described a, quote, new world of work in which many organizations will have no center at all. In fact, they'll have as many centers as there are people. Has that happened? Well, I think it's, it's happening to some degree, for sure. Um, even in my book, I didn't predict that it would happen everywhere. Uh, but one of the key points of the book, The Future of Work, is to say that I think we're in the early stages of an increase in human freedom in business. I think this change may, in the long run, be as important a change for business as the change to democracies was for governments. The reason I think that's happening, or what that means actually, is that uh, it's now possible to have the economic benefits of very large organizations things like economies of scale, and at the same time to have the human benefits of very small organizations. The first thing that comes to mind, of course, is uh, are the car services, Uber. Uber being a company with upwards of $2 billion of yearly revenue, worth about $40 billion in market capitalization with less than 1,000 em employees. However, they use hundreds of thousands of independent co contractor drivers. It's an example of exactly the phenomenon I was talking about. Okay. Uh, that in the old days, if you were going to have a global taxi service like what e Uber provides today, you would have hired as employees taxi drivers in cities all over the world. Uber has provided exactly the same function by contracting with freelance workers, freelance drivers, who in many cases aren't just providing their labor as contractors, but they're also providing the use of the vehicle that they themselves own as contractors. And is that a good thing for the worker? Is that a good thing for the economy? Is that a good thing for in investors? Right, so I think in all cases it can be a good thing, but it's not guaranteed to be a good thing. I think this is one of the cases where we have a choice about how we do it, and whether it turns out well or not depends in part on how we make those choices. Well, the question I think for workers is whether or not they're going to be able to 
achieve some semblance of a stable and well-fed and well-clothed life. And the imperative, it seems, for companies like Uber uh, is to maximize their value as much as possible. Do you see a place for a regulatory framework in offering up uh, pay protections and unemployment protections for workers of less skilled jobs? So I guess I, I don't actually have a strong feeling, a strong personal feeling about whether that should be done or not. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do have a strong personal feeling about is that it shouldn't depend on whether you call them employers or contractors. The growth in employment over the last few years has been mostly in part-time workers, at least since the recession. And more and more full-time jobs uh, are evaporating. And in fact, the Federal Reserve just said back in February that most of the people who have taken part-time jobs since, let's say, 2009, 2010, are people who are really looking for full-time jobs, are people who are not paying the, paying the bills. But how are workers supposed to manage themselves in a part-time economy? Great question. I was just about, to, that. Just about to bring up uh, a concept which uh, I wrote about in my book in 2004, but I think is still not by any means widely appreciated by most people in our economy. And, and you're that, talking about guilds. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a way of having uh, organizations whose purpose is to provide for freelance workers many of the kinds of benefits they used to get from being full-time employees. So you could call these organizations societies, you could call them networks, you could call them associations, but the word we like best is the word guilds, kind of harking back to the medieval craft guilds. Uh, and the idea is that these these guilds would provide for their members who are independent workers the services those members would want. For instance, one very important kind of service they could provide is this kind of income security. So you could say, as a guild member, I'll pay a certain percentage of my income to the guild in return for, in the good times, in return for a guaranteed minimum income in the bad times. Let me jump in just for one second. The, the Forbes most promising company for 2015 is Instacart. Uh, Forbes is hog wild over, over Instacart. They have um, a market cap now of several, several billion dollars. And the, the sort of median pay that an Instacart shopper gets for going to Instacart, just for our audience, is a group where you can go online tell what groceries you want or what shopping you want done, and then uh, that will connect with a worker with his iPhone, his or her iPhone, and they will go do the work, do the shopping, do the collecting, bring it back. And there's a million other, there's TaskRabbit, there's some others. Those pay about 10, 10 bucks an hour, and those are really growing quickly. And uh, are you saying that an Instacart worker who's making $10 an hour when he or she is working could pay a piece of what he or she is getting to an Instacart guild of some kind and then in that way bank, bank money for the lean times? Yeah, I think the idea is independent of the dollar amount. You know, certainly at some very, very low dollar amount, you may not want to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the idea is a, a good idea for many different levels of income. Let's stick with Instacart. Do you see that kind of a thing happening with people doing shopping, services on, in an Elance setting? Uh, I see no reason why it couldn't happen. I think if I were an Instacart worker, I'd be very interested in the possibility of joining a guild that would give me some kind of income security if I could. Okay, so if you're an Instacart worker and you're waiting for a job and you get two or three jobs a day, don't forget you're not getting paid while you're not working. You're getting paid for what you're doing. Do you foresee a guild providing a sort of unemployment or underemployment insurance for the, for the workers? The pay is so low and the conditions so terrible, maybe not. Uh, but then I think we're talking about a societal problem which we should consider addressing in other ways. Uh, as a society, we might say uh, we want all of our members who are willing to work to have opportunities to do so. So maybe we will make special investments in creating uh, new kinds of work, new kinds of jobs. 
Maybe we'll give special um, tax credits to companies that create jobs. Uh, they, they're not, say, maybe they don't have to pay income tax uh, as, at as high a rate if they've created new jobs instead of uh, okay, so not, you're, for instance. So you're in favor of government intervention to that extent to try and manage the economy for the benefits of underemployed workers if the economic conditions are not optimal. I, I'm saying that's certainly an option we should consider. Another okay. even more straightforward option is just income redistribu redistribution. Through taxation? Well, we happen to live in a country that does that today. You're suggesting that it's some radical idea. Um. You're right, of course. <laughs> it's a question of amount, degree. We have, some, we have the lowest income taxation of any large industrialized country. Are you advocating, given persistent underemployment, increasing income taxes and capital gains taxes in order to redistribute wealth? So I'm actually not here to take any kind of strong political position on these things. Um, uh, I think you can make good arguments on both sides of that question. Um, uh, uh, I have my own personal opinions, but I don't think that's kind of the key point here. Um, well, I, I what, think what is the point, and I think what we're getting at is, um, and I, it's really no one's particular achievement or fault, but and you could tell me whether I'm wrong, we're here to talk about the future of mm -hmm. employment, but mm -hmm. Kodak at its height mm -hmm. had about 150,000 employees. Mm -hmm. That's about 1988. Instagram, which is what many people see as the new Kodak, was sold to Facebook for about a billion bucks, and it has 13 employees. <laughs> 13. It's a good program. I use it. The question is, as things are moving forward, the Instagram, for my children, they don't even know the word Kodak. It sounds to them like Shinola boot polish. It's absolutely, and given the movement, given what you predicted in 1987, where the Kodaks are falling and the Instagrams are rising, and uh, where is the place for a worker to find him or herself? How could they find him or herself and achieve for lack of a better word, a middle-class life? Yeah, so that is an important question. Uh, it's one that's got all kinds of kind of aspects, including uh, kind of the very political things we were talking about a minute ago about These are political doing, questions. doing yeah. income redistribution of various sorts. I think that's clearly an option that uh, we, we already use and should consider the possibility of using more okay. if we can't figure out better ways of doing it. I think a better way in many people's minds, including my own, would be if we can create new jobs to provide things to do for the people who want to do things. You did say in 2011 that much of the, of the pros prosperity of our world, now it comes from the productivity gains of chopping work up into ever smaller tasks performed by ever more specialized workers, workers drawn from anywhere and for small units of time. And one of the examples that you brought up is something that I never even knew about until I began to research this is mechanical Turk. I always thought of that term as being a, a, a machine chess player. <laughs> but mechanical Turk is Amazon's service for handing out micro tasks, tasks that pay everywhere, anywhere from one cent to a few bucks, doing tasks that take anywhere from five minutes to a couple hours. You also mentioned top, top Coder, which is a much more high-end service where uh, software companies will bid out their software development jobs to talented people throughout the world and then pull their work together. Is that what you meant when you were writing about hyper-specialization? Uh, you were talking about farmers. Farmers grow food. But now we're talking about people doing tiny bits of work. Do you see that trend going forward? I do. Uh, so you're right. Those are both examples, I think, good examples that we use to talk about what we mean by hyper-specialization. Um, we're all familiar with the idea of division of labor as we've seen it in factories for physical work. Yes. Um, what now we're talking about electronic work. Now we're talking about knowledge work, which is, which is enabled, by, enabled to be done in new ways by electronic technologies. So uh, for instance, one of the reasons I think we're about to see much more of this division of labor and knowledge work, as we've seen for several centuries in physical work, 
is because the new technologies make it possible to get global economies of scale for highly specialized knowledge work. Uh, you can find one person in one place who can do all the work in the world, maybe not all, but a lot of the work in the world for you know, finding misplaced commas in a sentence um, uh, or telling you what are the rules of evidence for murder trials in Texas or you know, whatever tiny little there are too many piece of, of thing, <laughs> whatever, whatever tiny little um, uh, piece of things uh, you want, you can have somebody specialized as being the best in the world at doing that. It strikes me that those jobs are perhaps best for the companies themselves because they, they get to pay so little. One of the, there's a company called Gigwalk. I don't know if you've heard of Gigwalk. Gigwalk is on the same model and what they do is they will get a bunch of workers to go check retail displays, check to see how marketing is being done in a variety of stores. And in 2013, the president of Gigwalk said, you can hire 10,000 people for 10 or 15 minutes, and when they're done, those 10,000 people can just melt away. That was his pitch to yeah. employers. So I think what you're coming back to here is that we are in a time of significant economic transition. And As we were 100 years ago when farms were becoming mechanized. Correct, correct. Uh, and I think I'm inclined to be optimistic about the long run uh, outcomes of that transition. Where I think we're headed now is not just a career trajectory where you go from one full time job to another over the course of your career, but what you might call a career portfolio, which is you have a bunch of jobs at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you know, the, the workers who are working on Mechanical Turk. Maybe they do that for a little while to kind of get warmed up, and then they go work for Top Coder or Innocentive or Odesk, uh, and then they do some uh, X-ray interpretation or whatever. I mean, this particular combination of things may not be common, but the point is that any individual can create their own portfolio of tasks uh, throughout the course of a day uh, and even to take your gig walk workers, maybe they do that because they like a chance, an excuse to get out and walk around a little bit, but then they go back to their apartment and spend a while doing uh, a portfolio of online work and do Mr. some other Malone, things. you would agree that the gig walk workers are not necessarily doing that because they like the fresh air. They're doing it because they need the money. Uh, actually and don't. the Federal Reserve tells us that the gig walk workers of the world are deeply frustrated because they're looking for longer term employment to provide them the money that they need. Right. Are we, are, are we, I don't know what the word is, putting lipstick on a pig by saying, well, you're working, going from store to store, and that's because you like the fresh air. Wouldn't, we, wouldn't you agree that people are doing those kinds of jobs because they need the 10, 15, 25 dollars that they're going to get from it? Uh, I actually don't know enough about this case to know. I do know that in the case of Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, some of the people who do that uh, make lots of money in their regular jobs and they do this just kind of for fun in the evening for a while. They're monetizing their downtime is the term. They're, they're doing a com something kind of like a hobby which they happen to get paid for. Robert Reich calls this the share the scraps economy. I think you know who Robert Reich is obviously. Uh, he, he, he says that the big money goes to the corporations that own the software while the ever smaller scraps go to on-demand workers. He also says that it's a terrible deal for the workers and postulates that they're exploited. I don't know. What do you say to, to, to Mr. Rush? Well, uh, I think there are some people who are exploited in our economy. Um, uh, and I don't know what we can do about that completely. Uh, we can do some things to reduce that, but I think um, the best solution is to do a better job of creating work for anyone who wants it and matching people to the work they can do best. So, you know, I, I don't think so I... So should Instacart perhaps pay its workers more? I don't think an economy can survive on people paying 
more for the things they use to create their products than they can afford to pay. Well, Forbes responded to Robert Reich with what they called a bit of a reality check. Mm -hmm. Mr. Reich, what, I'm going to paraphrase, but I've read this several times, that a job isn't there to make workers happy, is what Forbes said. A job isn't there to create a specific lifestyle or stability. A job is there to fulfill a need of the em employer for a rate of pay that the market demands, which is the very minimum that, uh, th that uh, the employer will pay with the, very max, with the very minimum that the worker will take. Is that, that's the nature, that's how Forbes put it, that it's just a yeah. cold calculus with each job. And if you do a mechanical Turk job that's worth eight cents, that's about what it's worth. Yeah, so um, I don't agree with that either. Okay. Um, uh, I think that it's uh, certainly limited and probably a mistake to think that the only goal of businesses is to maximize their financial return. Does it strike you that the market as it is currently configured and as you see it configuring itself in the coming 10 to 15 years will vindicate the human value of economic security for uh, a, a larger number of workers? I am not at all convinced that this is going to happen in the short term. I think this is one of the things about which we have to make choices. And I believe that to the degree we can be more conscious about making choices, not only in our personal lives, but in our lives as workers and as consumers and as investors. I think in all those ways we have opportunities to exert influence on the operation of our economy according to our values. And I think if we do that well, we can make a better world for all of us. Leaving Robert Reich for the moment and going to a more centrist view, which is the McKinsey Global Institute issued a report a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago at this point, warning that growing economic inequality among the working pop populations is a direct threat to social stability not only to the economy by reducing demand, mm -hmm. there's few, fewer people with money, there's fewer people buying things, so mm -hmm. it's going to create a spiral. And people who are fantastically rich, they can't spend all the money that, mm -hmm. that they have. But they described the current situation with the, with the job market, both in America and Europe and other developed economies, seriously at risk. Mm -hmm of global instability, that is, right. riots. And I was struck by that because McKinsey is, is a consulting company for large, large businesses. And it seemed to me that they were doing, uh, that they were handing out some bitter medicine to some of their clients. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, uh, this is actually not my area of expertise. Uh, it seems plausible to me. I, I, I certainly have read and find uh, plausible some of the research that suggests that when there's too much inequality in a society, a lot of things don't work well. Uh, so I think it's a desirable thing to have less inequality, less economic inequality in a society. I guess uh, the, is that the question is how would the job market, how would future directions in the job market reduce that or exacerbate it? How do you see, how do you see the trajectory over the next 5, 10, 15 years as far as economic inequality? People getting paid five cents for mechanical Turk jobs, investors making a fortune investing in companies such as Instacart. Yeah, well, I think there are several things to say about that. One is, uh, if you imagine a completely free market with no government intervention, no taxes at all, or anything like that, uh, it's possible, it's very difficult to predict what will happen. There are some parameters would say inequality should decrease, others that would say it should increase. Um, uh, I certainly don't know enough, and I suspect that no one knows enough to predict confidently whether the trends underway today are going to lead to more or less of this in the medium term. Um, uh, either way, if you believe that having too much inequality isn't good and that we're in danger of having too much, then there are plenty of uh, levers governments can pull to deal with that. 
redistribution of income in various ways, for instance. If I was 18 years old, we're here in the inner city of Boston now. If I was an 18-year-old kid coming out of the local high school and I've got a B average, I'm a good kid that's always gone to school, what advice, and I like science, but my parents don't have any money. What advice would you give me or give that kid as far as planning his life in the workplace? My advice would be the world of the future will be one where routine work will be done more by machines. So you should try to prepare yourself for doing non-routine things to the degree you want to get a special edge in the economy of the future. Uh, if you have a creative bent, try to encourage that. Um, uh, uh, certainly becoming educated will help you in the medium term. Uh, uh, in, the, or in the short term, in the medium term, I think formal education of the sort we think about may become less important. My last question, which is, there's a tremendous number of people who are uh, in their 50s, who have years left of work in them, whose pensions have gone away for one reason or another in the recession. Their equity in their homes has been eradicated by the recession. They're finding themselves uh, of a certain age and unable to figure out how to pay the bills or meet their obligations. What do you tell people who are in their 50s now, who are facing a much longer life expectancy? How do you tell, you've now given advice to an 18-year-old good kid. What do you give, what advice do you give to a 55-year-old good man or woman without the savings that they thought they had? And whose job perhaps doesn't exist anymore? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people like that and going to be even more. Uh, I think it's a problem for our society. Um, I think many of those people will end up working a lot longer than they would have thought they would, uh, even if they're working at jobs, Del, that, Del are, Taco or place like that. jobs that are below their skills. Um, I wish we had better answers. Maybe there are some, but I don't have any off the top of my head. Okay. Well... On that note, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you.